You know, um, I'm the White House Chief of Staff uh, who has worked for more other White House Chiefs of Staff than any other White House Chief of Staff. I've worked for nine different White House Chiefs of Staff. And so I approached the job with some thoughts about how each of the nine of the other people I've worked for had done the job, the things that worked, the things that didn't work, the things I admired, the, things, the ways I wanted to model myself after them. And then, of course, I had to then take that and make sure it worked for the president. Because in the end, while White House Chief of Staff is a fancy title, the White House Chief of Staff is a staff person. He or she serves the principal, and the principal is the president of the United States. Now, I've had the good fortune to work for Joe Biden off and on for more than 30 years. Um, and so I know him well and know what, uh, what his needs are and how he likes to be staffed and how he likes the operation to go. So, you know, as I said, I came to it with the benefit of really having a lot of experience with working with other chiefs of staff, uh, experience working with Joe Biden, and those two things really shaped my thinking about the job. Tina, you, um, I want to ask you a, a similar question. You know, the role of vice president is oftentimes less defined, right? It really depends on the person, the occupant of that role and what they choose to make of the role and the relationship with the president and, and how they've decided the role should play out. So I'm wondering, when you got the call by then vice president-elect Kamala Harris asking you to be her chief of staff, how did uh, what did you think about her role, your role in helping to shape uh, and define her role? Would love your thoughts on the office of the vice president and, and how you fit into that. Well, um, let me start by echoing what Ron said and congratulations to Georgetown. And I'm always so happy to do anything that's related to Georgetown. It's some of my happiest memories of my life being there. Um, and also happy Earth Day. Um, in answer to your question, um, I think that you start by this first word, which is vice, um, before president. Um, and I know that Vice President Harris, when she started thinking about the job, her thoughts were, how do I be full partner to President Joe Biden? And that guided my thinking about the job. And I was fortunate in the time that I was thinking about it and since being here, that I'm often in a room and I look around and there are three former chiefs of staffs to vice president, Ron, Steve, Rachetti, and Bruce Reed, who've been tremendous guide in everything that I've been trying to do and everything that the vice president's been trying to do as well, along with our other colleagues. But her goal is, again, to make sure that she is an informed and active partner to the vice, to the president and that she brings to the table her knowledge and experience to enhance the work that this administration wants to do. It's been um, a marathon uh, since the day that we got here on the 20th, but I think that she is very pleased as is I think most people have looked at what the administration has accomplished and what we've been able to do with a lot of help and a lot of holding hands with each other through the process. Back during the transition, the, uh, the, the transition team identified four sort of major crises that they announced, that you all announced you're going to bring a whole of government approach to. So as we uh, uh, approach the 100 day mark, I, I just want to touch on each one briefly and just sort of hear your thoughts on, the, on each of those biggest successes, biggest challenges moving forward. So let's start with with obviously the big one, and that is COVID. Um, Ron, you've had to deal with a pandemic before in your previous job. Yeah. Um, so drawing on that experience, how did you all decide to approach this pandemic? I, 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 I presume that you would say the, the vaccine distribution is one of the biggest success stories of it. Um, but I'd love to hear what do you think the biggest successes have been so far and what's the biggest challenge moving forward? Well, sure, Mo. So first of all, I, I do think the vaccine distribution is a, not just a, a success story, but a, a historic achievement for this administration, for the whole country. And, uh, you know, I start with the basic approach we took, which was two fundamental changes from the approach we inherited. First of all, the federal government took full responsibility for this vaccine program. We didn't say it was just a state and local problem. Our state and local partners are very, very important, but we set up federal vaccination sites. We deployed federal troops to administer vaccinations. We deployed the 
uh, FEMA to operate a lot of these sites and to staff a lot of sites around the country. We deployed an entire new federal distribution system to push the vaccine out through community health centers to reach a lot of people, disadvantaged people who weren't getting the vaccine, to uh, push it through a federally established uh, network of pharmacies to push the vaccine out. So the first thing we did was we took responsibility for the vaccine distribution. The second thing we did is we said, we're just not going to spare any effort here. And the president ordered the team to purchase hundreds of millions of more doses. So we would have more than enough to vaccinate every American, um, w even if one of the vaccines didn't work out. We went and bought a lot more Pfizer, more Moderna. J&J uh, wasn't yet approved. Uh, so we were ready, no matter what happened, to keep the vaccine program on track. And with all those changes, we've gone from a situation where, for example, when we got here, uh, there were 400,000 seniors in America who were fully vaccinated. Uh, who, had, uh, who were fully vaccinated. Uh, now um, there are 65% uh, of the seniors in America are fully vaccinated. 80% have had one shot. It's been a dramatic turnaround, and of course now we're reaching out to the population as a whole. Look, I think the biggest problem going forward on COVID is uh, persuading people to continue to do the social distance measures we need them to do until we get more of the population vaccinated. Until Everyone has a chance to get that shot, uh, two shots. And then, uh, you know, finishing the vaccine distribution. We have now vaccinated with at least one shot, about 52% of the adults. There's obviously millions more people we need to reach. We're doing about 3 million more a day. Uh, There's still a number of days left to go on that. So uh, we made a lot of progress on that, but we still have a lot of work to do, particularly in the month of May and the month of June, as we head towards that date that the president set of July 4th, and trying to get this country closer back to normal by that date. I've got so many follow-ups, but I'm going to hold those back, maybe uh, come back to some of these issues so that we can cover as much ground as possible. Plus, the student questions are always better than mine. Um, Tina, one of the other big issues that um, was identified was the issue of equity. Uh, a, a topic that really sort of bubbled to the surface again with all of um, uh, the death last summer of George Floyd and others. And uh, after the Derek Chauvin verdict came down, the vice president spoke very eloquently and passionately about systemic racism and the need for equity in education and health care, housing, economic and criminal justice system. Uh, I'm wondering uh, your thoughts on how has the administration moved towards that? in its first 100 days? And how would you measure success moving forward? Well, you know, um, Mo, I'd like to start by saying, when we think about this issue, when I think about it, um, you know, I grew up in a deep South, in a segregated South. And a lot of people may think that was just 100 years ago, but it wasn't 100 years ago. It wasn't 150 years ago. It's been in my lifetime that I went to colored only waiting rooms and sat in segregated parts of movie theaters and everything that went along with that. So this is an issue that is real in my lifetime. And what I have seen demonstrated in this administration from the very top, that is from President Biden on down and certainly felt deeply by the vice president and everyone else we're working with is that this is a systemic problem and it has to be addressed in that way that you have to look at all of the things and all the pressure points when you can say the change has to happen. And that as the federal government in places where we can make change happen, we're gonna do that. If it's the way that we do procurement, if it's the way we do hiring, if it's the way that we think about the policies and whom they affect. Um, if we look at healthcare and say there's a disproportionate effect on people of color because of these policies or practices, then those things are gonna change. And it has to be a whole government approach, but it has to start with people at the very top and across the board and the people you hire and bring into the administration, believing that this is something important and believing that it's something that affects not just people of color, but everybody, and that we're a better country if we take it on and address it. Ron, let's, um, let's turn to the economy. Um, obviously, it was intricately linked with the COVID crisis, which is why you guys uh, pushed the uh, American Relief Plan so aggressively uh, uh, and got it through Congress. Now you're um, 
out there selling the American Jobs Plan. Um, I, I'd love your thoughts a little bit on uh, both of these have been highly polarized in the halls of Congress, despite receiving significant public support. Um, would love your thoughts on sort of where we are vis-a-vis the economic turnaround uh, and what is possible moving forward with the American Jobs Plan, realistically, given the dynamics of the Congress? Well, first of all, the week Joe Biden became president, uh, 800,000 people filed for unemployment. The week before that, a million people had filed for unemployment. So we were hemorrhaging jobs as a country. Uh, we took over after the first administration since Hoover's to lose jobs. Uh, and the turnaround with our policies that have uh, both increased vaccinations, increasing confidence, and also made it clear that our economic strategy is going to be uh, working from the bottom up and the middle out, not just the top down. And we're already starting to see the change. Joe Biden's going to become the first president in history to create a million new jobs in its first 100 days. Uh, that's the product of our policies, the hard work of the American people, of course, uh, and the progress we've made so far. The problem is we still have millions more people out of work. And even though we've turned this thing around, we're headed in the right direction, there's a lot of work left to do to get the economy where it needs to be. That's what the American Jobs Plan is all about. It's about creating the jobs we need, not just for the short term, but for the long term. It's an eight-year plan to rebuild our roads, our bridges, uh, connect broadband, create caring infrastructure, our water systems, housing, uh, the green infrastructure we need, electric charging stations, all the things we need to be successful and productive as a country in the future. Now, I think those things are bipartisan ideas. Certainly, if you ask voters, Democratic and Republican voters alike, they want to see this country win in the 21st century. They want to see us be competitive and be able to prevail in the world economy. And they want to see good jobs, not just jobs, but good jobs, high paying jobs for themselves and their children. That's what the jobs plan is about. We had an encouraging turn today. Senator Capito from West Virginia uh, and uh, with a number of Republican colleagues put forward an offer on the table. It's not where we want to be yet, but it's encouraging that they're moving in that direction. I'm uh, optimistic about those conversations with her and other Republicans, both in the House and Senate. Uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris have hosted, I think, something like 25 or 30 members of the House and Senate in the Oval Office in the past three weeks, Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, talking about infrastructure, and I see a lot of enthusiasm for it. So I'm cautiously optimistic that after decades of promising this country that we do what we need to do to be competitive, the Congress will work with the president and we'll finally get it done. Let me stay with you for a moment, Ron. Um, today is, is Earth Day, as Tina yeah. mentioned earlier, uh, and the president today announced his goal of having emissions uh, in the United States by the year 2030. Um, look, climate, there, there are a few issues that animate young people, uh, that animate students up at the Georgetown campus as much as climate does. Uh, and while there continues to be strong public support for some sort of action, Washington keeps hitting roadblocks. And so at the 100-day mark, or as you approach the 100-day mark, Give us a sense as to where you think we are, where the Biden administration is right now in tackling climate and what comes next? What, what, what's the plan moving forward? Well, look, I think where we are is, first of all, let's start with where we are, which is back in Paris. The day before Joe Biden became president, the Trump administration rescission of our agreement to the Paris Accord was supposed to take effect. On his first day as president, he made it clear America's part of the global community fighting climate change. And they invited the leaders of the world to participate in the summit, uh, which had to be a virtual summit today, but nonetheless was an unbelievable collection of leaders of the largest emitter countries in the world, uh, where a number of them made commitments to fight climate change, significant commitments, including our commitment of a nationally determined contribution of a reduction between 50 and 52 percent of our emissions against the, against the baseline. Now, what does that mean? That means we're going to create a lot of jobs in this country in growing the, the parts of our economy that are clean energy, it means a lot of jobs in solar and wind, building electric cars, uh, redeploying, building charging stations for those electric cars, uh, building new sources of power, uh, a lot of jobs in innovation around that. I mean, the world is moving in this direction and the direction that President Biden, Vice President Harris are putting America on is to be the global leader 
in creating these good, high paying jobs that help our country and other countries use cleaner and cleaner energy and combat climate change. And I think we are on that track now. Now, of course, we got to then go through that. We got to follow through on the path to Glasgow and the next big international climate meeting near the end of the year. Uh, but I think uh, we've made a big start today with this uh, climate conference that President Biden hosted uh, with our rejoining Paris, with our co commitment, and with the plan the president's put before the Congress to make these investments to create the infrastructure and the jobs that will power our clean energy future. Tina, I want to talk about uh, another issue that's obviously uh, uh, commanded the attention of the administration. Um, and that is um, the growth of people coming across the southern border. Um, we've seen a huge growth in the number of unaccompanied minors coming across the southern border. The president tasked the vice president with dealing with the Northern Triangle countries to, to help figure out the root cause and how do we address the root cause to maybe prevent these people from deciding to take this risky journey in the first place. Can you talk to us a little bit about your office's role there and, and the approach moving forward? Absolutely. Um, today, as a matter of fact, the vice president hosted a meeting with the heads of five or six major um, foundations who are active in the Northern Triangle. Um, she met with them for about 90 minutes, two hours. Fascinating conversation. These are people who do work in the region, are knowledgeable about the challenges that the people who live there face, many of them, and also about the possibilities if we can focus the kind of help and attention that they need. Um, the vice president always says that most people, given the option, will want to stay home. They'll want to stay in their home country where they have family, where the language is the same, the culture that they've grown up with. These people, most of them who are leaving the country, and you're right to say that it's a dangerous and arduous journey and a tough decision to make to leave their country are leaving because they have to, either because of violence, poverty, um, because of food insecurity, and also climate related um, issues um, they've had three, two or three major hurricanes in the past few years, which have devastated the region. So all of those um, causes, and there's also levels of violence and corruption as well that have been going on for years and years, but where we think that we can possibly help by making some changes in those regions, by investing in the acute and root causes, and the acute causes being the immediate needs that the people there have. And with the help of not only the agencies and federal government, but also with leaders like the foundation heads that we met with today, with leaders from the civil society with whom the pres vice president, excuse me, will be meeting next week. We hope to be able to make change. Um, no one who's studied the history of this region or seen what has happened in the past few years thinks that this will be a quick fix. Certainly the vice president doesn't, the president doesn't, but um, it's something that she's committed to, is something that's important to us. And I think as good neighbors is something that we should be doing. So the work is going to be difficult, but it is what we should be doing. The vice president is putting her shoulder to the wheel. And um, in just the several weeks that she's been directing this effort, um, we like to say we're seeing progress um, and we're looking forward to additional progress in the region as we deal with all the things that lead people to leave their homes when they actually would probably want to stay. In a, just a couple of moments, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. And so just a friendly reminder to the audience, you can continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, throughout this program. And when we get to you, uh, someone will let you know. But before we turn to the audience questions, I, I want to um, maybe move a little bit away from policy and talk just about the political environment that we're living in right now. Um, the president ran on a campaign to unify America, ran on a, on a, on a promise to unify America. Um, 
one thing that has been very fascinating to me now, uh, now that I've hung up my practitioner spurs and I'm, and I'm, and I'm watching this all as an observer is how many different definitions there are of unity. Um, we see, we can't seem to be unified on what unity means. Uh, and, you know, people, critics of the administration saying you don't really mean it because you're not doing things in a bipartisan manner. Other people talking about civility. There's, there's lots of different uh, ways people are talking about this. So I would love to hear from either or both of you. Um, what does it mean? And are we more unified as a nation? A uh, hundred day, nearly a hundred days into this new administration. If so, why? And if and if not, why not? What's the obstacle? Well, I'll take a first stab, and Tina can chime in. Uh, look, I think that unity means this country coming together to tackle problems with common purpose and common uh, resolve. And I think uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of unity. For example, around this vaccine program, I see people, young and old volunteering in our vaccination centers all, all over the country. People who are Republicans, Democrats, independents, people of all races coming together to get themselves vaccinated, to get their neighbors vaccinated, to help pull off this achievement that it was a logistical miracle that we are vaccinating 3 million people a day, 200 million shots in 90 days. Uh, you know, the, the kind of unity of purpose and unity of effort that is involved in that, I think is very impressive to see. We're also seeing on a more political level, a broad bipartisan support in the country as a whole for the initiatives that the president and the vice president brought forward for doing something about infrastructure, for the rescue plan that the Congress passed, for our action to increase childcare and these other measures that the president and vice president are bringing forward. Now in Washington, that's the place where you'd last expect unity to break out, I think. But even there, we're starting to see some progress. Uh, Joe Biden became the first president since Ronald Reagan to get every member of a statutory cabinet confirmed without any of them going down in defeat. And every single one of those cabinet members got a bipartisan vote. So I think there's some progress there. Uh, we continue to be in conversations with members of the Republican Party about legislative things we can do together. As I said earlier, a letter today from Republicans signaling some interest in working with us for infrastructure. So I think Washington will be the last place to change. But I think you're starting to see this building sense of national spirit, of progress, of unified action around a lot of our common problems in the country. And I do think that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have contributed to that. I also think there's just a great American thirst for that. And I think they're helping to, to answer that thirst. Well, I, if I, if I may, I agree with everything that um, Ron has just said. And uh, your question, Mo, I think you're forcing me to use my Georgetown education to think back. Um, That's, that was the whole goal, you know, that's goal. A to think back on some of these big questions. And, you know, look, the world has changed. And I, I think our idea of our perception of what unity looked like or what it should look like may be changing. That sounds weird, but I, I've been giving this a lot of thought and perhaps, perhaps it has changed. Um, I do think that people share common goals. Uh, we may have different ways of articulating them or thinking about them or getting to them, but they are really the big goals, I think, remain the same and they remain common to everybody. They want health. They want to be able to educate their families. They want to have a secure future. They want to feel safe in their neighborhoods. They want to feel that they have somewhere to go when all of this is said and done and they've contributed. I think all of that is true. Um, I think we've gotten tied up by so much that's built to divide us and what we're trying to get back to is getting away from those things. And I think that this administration and the two people who are heading the administration have had a big hand in making people see what we can be, what it was at one time, and what it can be again when we don't govern by distraction. I think that's very important. Okay. Again, I have so many different ways I would like to follow up, but let uh, I'll take a step back now and let's start to bring in uh, the audience. Uh, when I call on you, please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, your Georgetown affiliation, if you're a student, school year, um, where you're Zooming in from, and then 
go ahead and ask your question. So the first question will come from Divjot. Divjot, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mo, and thank you so much um, to both of you for being here. This has been such a great event. Uh, my name is Divjot Bawa. I am an undergraduate student in the School of Foreign Service majoring in science, technology, and international affairs, um, and I'm zooming out of uh, Northern Virginia. So my question to both of you, or either of you, um, nearly 100 days ago on Inauguration Day, President's, President Joe Biden's enduring message was that of unity and togetherness. As President Biden looks to address Congress next week for the first time during his presidency, what advice will you be offering him? Thank you. Ron, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. First of all, uh, love those STIA majors. Go STIA. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I, I really don't need to give the president advice on how to speak to the national moment and, and the unity. He, he knows what's in his heart. He knows what he believes in. And I think what you'll see him say to the Congress next week when he does address this joint session of Congress on Wednesday night is the need for us to take action, the need for us to prove that our government can deliver again, prove that we can move forward on these long-standing problems. I mean, the, the thing about where we are right now in this country is there's very little debate about what our problems are. We know we need to beat the virus. We know we need to get the economy moving again. We know that we need to tackle systemic racism. We know we need to tackle climate change. We need to do something about gun control. We need to do something about democracy reform. We need to do something about immigration. We need to do something about health care. These problems are there. They've been lingering. And I think the question is now, are we a moment of action on those problems? And I think that's what you'll hear from the president next Wednesday night is a call to action around those problems, around those challenges. That's what the American people want. I mean, I think you hear that all the time, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, they want to see action on these problems. And I think that's what you're going to hear the president talk about next Wednesday night. And if I could add to that, um, one of the things that I found most compelling since I've been here um, in the White House is being in meetings with the vice president and seeing how he reacts to discussions about policy. And he always brings it back to one thing. He says, I need to know what the story is that I'm telling here. And by that, what he means is, how is this going to affect the average person? How is this going to change someone's life? How is this going to improve someone's life? How is this going to deal with problems they're facing? He is clear-eyed. I can assure you, and I agree with Ron, we don't need to give him a lot of advice on what to say. He knows what he wants to say, and he also knows what he wants to do, and I think that's what you will hear when he gives that address. And, and there's one more thing I should say, if I could jump back in here for a second. Uh, that session on Wednesday night is also going to be interesting in one other respect. For the first time in American history, behind the president when he speaks will be two women, a woman vice president and a woman speaker of the House. The president's been addressing the Congress since George Washington did it. Uh, it wasn't until 14 years ago that the first time one of those two seats was filled by a woman. So that took a long time to get to that milestone. 14 years later, for the first time, there'll be two women behind the president when he gives that joint address on Wednesday night. Okay. Divjot, thanks for the question. Uh, let's turn next to Aida. Aida, welcome and introduce yourself. Hi, thank you both so much for being here. My name is Aida Ross. I am a junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics, and I'm very excited to see all the progress that the administration has made in such a short amount of time. Um, so my question is, as one of the president and vice president's most trusted advisors, you have the responsibility of staying up to date on a lot of different policy issues. Um, however, when it comes to issues in international security, I can imagine that it's really difficult to assess the correct course of actions on a time crunch, whether that's wars, retaliatory actions, so on, um, especially if you don't have the luxury of really specializing in your job, um, your current position. So I'm wondering, what does your role look like here and how are you able to advise on these issues despite being somewhat of a generalist policy-wise? You mean specifically to international security issues? Um, that's that's what I was wondering, but um, you can apply it anywhere else too. <laughs> uh, well, if I may, on the, on the security issues, we have the great good fortune of having two leaders who've had years of experience, the, the president, um, his years in Congress, and the vice president, as you know, was on the intelligence committee. 
Um, so they're pretty steeped in those issues and we have the great good fortune um, of having, thankfully because of Ron and others and president and vice president and administration steeped in people who are very knowledgeable in all of those issues. Um, to your larger point about being a generalist, I would argue that I am the supreme generalist. Um, so that, that requires that you, you have to know a little bit about everything. You have to be able to jump into different situations and you have to understand what you have around you, people who know a lot more than you do in particular issues and are there to be a good and helpful partner to you. And that's, that's true, not only in this job, but in everything else you do in life. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add to Tina's excellent answer, I'd say is that, um, you know, when I'm in the situation room and I look around and see the incredibly talented men and women who the president and the vice president have assembled on their national security team, a diverse team, a team with incredible experience, backgrounds, uh, you know, it's just an impressive group of advisors. And I think they bring all kinds of experience to the table. They bring all kinds of advice to the table. Most of the time, I just shut my mouth and listen and then try to formulate some advice based on all that great wisdom and experience that's being uh, brought to bear. So, uh, you know, the good thing about uh, being the president's chief of staff, the vice president's chief of staff, is you have a lot of other people in the building who are have expertise, who have knowledge, who have a real in-depth uh, awareness of what's going on. And they're able to bring that to the table and help uh, provide the background and the information you need to make good, help make good decisions. Okay, Aida, thanks for the question. Uh, let's turn next to Eric. Eric, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Eric Washington. I'm in pursuit of a master's in public policy at the School of uh, Public Policy in McCourt. And uh, thank you, I'd like to also extend my thanks for, uh, for being here. I think it's a wonderful way to commemorate five years of GU politics. Uh, my question turns to staffing. Um, cabinet staffing appeared uh, strategically inclusive. Um, and I want to ask, were there any additional uh, staffing decisions that particularly target bipartisan inclusion? And if so, what were those staffing decisions? Well, uh, thanks for your question, Eric. I think that we're looking for a government that represents all the country. And, and that started with a real focus on a, a cabinet that looked like America. That's the first cabinet in history that is majority uh, people of color. It's the first cabinet in history that's evenly divided between men and women. Uh, but there's all kinds of other diversity as well. Um, that's also diversity of background uh, and also, as you say, diversity of ideological views. That last kind of diversity is in some ways the hardest because we need people who believe in the core mission of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, so we need to find people who are Republicans who also share our values, share our views. And as we build out the administration, we're finding those people. Uh, and I think you'll hear us announce more and more of those people as we begin to flesh out uh, the administration uh, more broadly. But I'm proud, very proud of the team the president, the vice president put together. Uh, it's a historically diverse team. Uh, and I think it's much stronger as a result, much more represents where this country is today and the kind of challenges the country faces. I'd like to just uh, reemphasize what Ron has just said. And um, we had recently the first meeting of the president's cabinet. And to just sit in that room and look around and see the people who were at the table. At one point, I looked across the table and there were four black women. Now that is just extraordinary. And it was not, of course, as Ron said, the only diversity in the room, but it was just a remarkable moment for me to look at that and see this is, elections matter. You know, this is important. Eric, thanks for the question. Okay, next up, uh, let's go to Justine. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, as a triple way myself, having graduated from medical school and the residency program and now finishing up my executive MBA, I am really proud to call you guys to call you guys fellow alumni. Um, so I my question concerns not the past hundred days, uh, but the next hundred days. What do you each consider uh, will be the biggest challenge heading into the next 100 days and approaching the midterms? 
And how do you see the filibuster playing a role or impeding the progress of the Biden administration moving forward? I mean, I'm thinking specifically of HR1 and the NDC statehood, uh, as well as gun control and policing measures. But I imagine that any number of the administration's priorities hang in the balance. Sure, well, I'll, I'll kick it off and let Tina fill in. Um, look, I think the biggest challenges in the next 100 days or the next 200 days or 300 days really start with our signature initiatives, the American Jobs Plan, the American Families Plan that the president will be announcing in the joint address next week to uh, you know, get this economy back on track, uh, fully back on track to create the jobs of the future, to really compete in the world economy, and well as to help our families, to help our families with basic needs like lifting children out of poverty, childcare, uh, education, paid leave, uh, healthcare, all these, all these things. And so I think that's the kind of the central part of our agenda going forward. But as you say, it's not the only agenda we have. We also have to keep vaccinating people and beating the virus. We have to make progress on climate change, on fighting racism, hopefully getting the George Floyd bill passed uh, this summer, if possible at all, really fighting for that. Uh, progress on democracy reform, as you mentioned, and a whole array of other issues, gun control. It's a big agenda. There's no question about it. And what President Biden has always said is we're going to make the most progress we can under whatever rules the Senate has and whatever rules the House have, whatever whatever kind of the makeup of the Senate and the, the House were. When he got elected president, we didn't know if we'd have a Democratic House. We certainly didn't know that we'd have a democratically controlled president, uh, Senate. We didn't know that till all the way up to January 6th. So we've been building our plans for progress under a variety of scenarios, under a variety of different ways these things could go. We're going to work hard with Democrats and Republicans on the Hill to try to advance that agenda. There are always obstacles. It's always hard. Uh, but we, uh, we, we think we've got uh, plans that are up to it. We've got um, a team that's up to it. And we're going to try to make progress on all these things in the weeks and months ahead. You know, when I heard your question, um, so many things went through my head because you're right, there's so many challenges in trying to do what the administration hopes to do. Um, one thing that's been a hallmark um, with this team really is sort of laser focused on what's important and what we have to do to get things done. And it doesn't mean that it's easy. But getting the American Rescue Plan across the finish line, um, it might have looked easy, it didn't look easy from the inside up to the last seconds. And Ron can speak to that in great detail. Um, these things are never easy, but what you have is a president and vice president who are laser focused that if we didn't get that done, we couldn't get anything else done. The same kind of focus is being brought to bear with the jobs plan and the family plan and also continuing to work around COVID. Um, the voting rights bills that you've mentioned, those are not gonna be a walk in the park. But as I like to always say, repeating what the vice president said to me once, when your name goes on the ballot, it doesn't have boxes next to it that say easy job, hard job. You don't get to check which one of them you take. You take the whole job. And so you have to fight every step of the way and be committed to it and be able to work with the people who are going to work with you to get it done. And that's the commitment here, I believe. Okay, Justine, thanks so much. Um, let's bring in a recent McCord School alum, uh, Jorge. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. And uh, thank you both so much for being here to celebrate this special anniversary. Uh, my name is Jorge Panjul, and I am a graduate alum of the McCord School and a former GU Politics Student Leadership Council member. I'm now a program director at a global nonprofit, and I'm zooming in from Washington, D.C. Given the polarized nature of U.S. politics today, the administration is now faced with a 50-year historic low in respect to the trust the American people have in their federal government. I'm not sure if this trend can be reversed, but where would you like to see the state of people's trust in government be at the end of your term? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I guess the simple answer is higher, but... Um, you know, look, I think that trust in government has eroded because the government hasn't really delivered for the people. A lot of other reasons, too. But I think at some core level, that's really what it comes down to, which is that people, as I said earlier, people kind of know what the problems are in the country and their government hasn't delivered. Uh, I expect to see that trust in government go up. Again, I think the vaccination program 
is a key thing in restoring trust in government. This country faced a big challenge like a lot of other countries did. It's one of the few in the world that's had the success it's had in administering the vaccine as quickly and as widely as it has. I hope that helps to restore people's trust in government. I think the fact that uh, the president, the vice president promised we'd send people $1,400 rescue checks if they won. And we got it done in less than 50 days. I hope that helps people restore their faith that when politicians make promises, they'll actually deliver on those promises and give people what they said they would get if they won. And now I think, you know, the rest of the rescue plan also helps restore some of that faith and confidence that the government can work, it can produce things, it can deliver results, it can make a difference in people's lives. I hope that restores their trust. And I hope that continues as we continue to deliver on things. I think there's one more thing that restores people trust in government, and that is a president, a vice president, who just tell it like it is. Uh, the, I think the president, uh, you know, stands up every day and tells people the good and the bad. I mean, I think that's one reason why people appreciate his leadership on COVID. He stands up and says, hey, we're making progress on this. We haven't made progress on that. We're making good progress on getting the vaccines done. We still don't have enough people doing the masking and the distancing. Cases are too high. You know, he doesn't try to whitewash things. He doesn't try to to spin things. He tries to tell people like it is good news and bad news. And I think that is a key factor in also helping to restore people's trust in government. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to say three things and I'm announcing three things so that I don't forget any of them. Um, and the first is that, and not in particular order, you know, I was born and raised in Georgia and I cannot tell you how proud I was um, when Georgia gave us those two senators and really, really made possible what the administration has been able to achieve. Um, and it's a remarkable statement about the people there, how they turned out. That's an indication of at least, I'm gonna give government a chance. I'm gonna try to change government. I'm gonna be a participant in making it work for everybody. So important, meant so much to so many people and will mean so much to so many people's lives moving forward. The other point I'd like to make is that before I came back to Washington to take this job, I lived in New York during the height of the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic in New York City, when we had a field hospital in Central Park in New York City, uh, when people really were afraid to go outside, to get on an elevator with one another, to do anything. And that has changed. And that's changed because of the steps that this administration's taken that people feel that they can walk outside, they can go to restaurants, they can do this, they can do that. They feel that there is a future and a path out of this. That's because of a belief in government. And the third thing that I would point to is the George Floyd verdict and the way that the president and the vice president spoke to that moment, which said so much about them and so much about what they believe this government should be standing for and doing. And I think people hear that and it makes a difference. Okay, Jorge, thanks so much. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time and I wanna to try to squeeze a couple more questions in. So let's go uh, to Sari. Hi, thank you so much to everyone for holding this. It's super exciting and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I had the pleasure of taking Professor Klein's uh, senior seminar on the controversies in constitutional law. And my question is, what do you see the biggest uh, challenges to the Supreme Court um, within the next four years? And how do you believe the administration will um, reconcile with those challenges? Great, well, first of all, it's great to see you. Great to see a student, thank you, it's great. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, Look, I think that the uh, challenges before the court, um, you know, are all the challenges that always divide our country. Uh, and we know specifically uh, before the court right now is, for example, the decision about uh, the Affordable Care Act, whether or not the, um, all the provisions of the Affordable Care Act are, are valid uh, and how that's going to be decided by the court before the end of this term. You know, I think one thing we're focused on is not just the Supreme Court, but the lower federal courts as well and uh, really uh, staffing those lower federal courts with qualified, diverse people. Uh, president Biden became the first president in history, recent history, to name a large number of judges within his first 100 days. I think President Obama named three, President Trump named two, something like that. Uh, we named 11 judges 
within the first 100 days. We might get a couple more in before the end of the 100 days. Uh, those judges include a remarkably diverse uh, group of people. Uh, no president in four years, in a single four-year term, had named two African-American women to the Court of Appeals. President Biden named two of them on a single day within his first 100 days. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is really uh, put the right kinds of people uh, on the courts, uh, try to bring um, diverse, also diverse uh, practice backgrounds for lawyers. Uh, that in recent years, the federal courts have been dominated by people who work for big private law firms. Uh, most of our nominees are coming from the public sector or from the defense bar, or other non-traditional backgrounds for federal judges. So we're focused on that. We're really focused on trying to um, fill those courts with qualified people uh, and uh, bring more balance to those courts. And I'm going to leave that answer with Professor Clay. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Yeah, I, I was going to say to any of your staff, Ron, that may be watching, I hope they take Sari's lead and refer to you as Professor Klain from now on. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate at the that. office. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks for the question. So we had uh, one more student queued up to ask a question, uh, but uh, she had to run. So I'm going to read her question because I think it's the perfect one to close out this particular event. It comes from a student named Catherine who asks, what in your time at Georgetown prepared you for your work in public service? Tina? Wow, wow that's, that's the hardest question we've had, I think. Um, at least for me, it was um, always the sense that you should lead a purposeful life, that you need to do something that mattered, that you need to do something that affected someone other than yourself. And that was something I think was just part of everything that I got at Georgetown the four years I was there, that there was something bigger than you. And you had an obligation to try to impact other people's lives. Yeah, Ron? I, I, yeah, I certainly think the, the school as a whole um, uh, really imbues that spirit in you. I hope it certainly did when I was a student there. I hope it still does. That idea that we should live for others, we should give back. I think is very important. Um, I got a lot from my professors, particularly uh, Dr. Valerie Earle, who was an esteemed professor in the government faculty, who just was a real mentor to me and did so much to encourage me to get involved in politics and policy. And then like a lot of students at Georgetown, I interned every semester. I got on that G2 bus and rode to DuPont Circle and took the then new Metro down to the Capitol Hill to uh, intern on the Hill and to work in a number of senators offices, congressmen's offices, uh, and get that experience. I think, you know, that's the unique thing about Georgetown. It's this combination of world-class academics in areas of public policy. Now with the addition of the McCourt School, but fantastic academics and public policy and, and, and government and uh, you know, political philosophy, all those things. And that chance by being in Washington to work hands-on in the government or for a think tank or for an advocacy group or any one of those opportunities that are really unique to being in Washington, DC. And now with this third branch, uh, the existence of GU politics, to bring all that together and to help lift up students' experiences and expose them to all kinds of programming, it's a really unique opportunity. I think every student at Georgetown should wake up every day and be grateful for the amazing experience they have there that can prepare them for a career in public service that cannot be matched at any other university in the United States. Um, Ron and Tina, there's so much more we could talk about. Um, and so we're just gonna have to get you both to do this again down the road uh, and hopefully God willing, on campus soon, um, where we can all gather in person to have this conversation. Um, we, you have both been such great friends to the university, have been such great friends to GU politics. We miss you on our advisory board. Uh, understand that you're a little busy. You couldn't fulfill our rigorous uh, obligations. Uh, so uh, we'll look forward to welcome, welcoming you back at some point down the road. Uh, so with that, I just can't say enough on behalf of Georgetown, on behalf of the McCord School, on behalf of the Institute of Politics and Public Service. Thank you both so much for your service. And thank you both so much for spending some time with us tonight. I also want to thank the audience, everyone who uh, gave up a little part of their evening to help us celebrate five years and to hear from Ron and Tina. Um, 
And I want to say to all of you that even though this has been a fantastic fifth anniversary keynote uh, and would be a great way to end the year, it's not how we're ending the year. Uh, we're not done with our fifth anniversary programming. Uh, so we are announcing tonight uh, that on Wednesday, May 5th, we will be teaming up with the White House Correspondents Association for a day-long three-part symposium on the press, the presidency, and trust. Information on how to RSVP is in the Zoom chat. will also be on all of our social media platforms. There'll be three panels. The first looking at how we sort of got to where we are in the relationship between the presidency and the press, featuring White House correspondents and former White House press secretaries. Our second panel is going to focus on the importance of who tells the story and the importance of diversity in the press corps with a fantastic panel of White House correspondents. And then the final panel uh, will be a conversation that I moderate between Zeke Miller, the president of the White House Correspondents Association, and Jen Psaki, the current White House press secretary and former GU politics fellow. So with that, uh, hope to see you at that event. Uh, again, thank you to Ron, to Tina, and to all of you. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.